Hello everyone, uh, good evening and a very warm welcome to today's IFOA University webinar series. Uh, we are delighted to invite Ian Allen to join us today uh, to share with us um, his experience um, and also with the students, you know, the various opportunities that are available for you if you wish to pursue a career in banking. Um, you know, during your actual qualification and your career journey. Uh, so Ian, as a brief background, he has over 30 years of experience working in banking. Uh, Ian qualified as an actuary, um, you know, based in Edinburgh. And, uh, you know, it's, it's a great opportunity today that we have uh, received many questions from the students in advance. Uh, and we will take this, um, you know, webinar as, as a way to reach out to more students to share some insights in banking. So without further ado, uh, you know, I'll hand over the, the floor to Ian and, uh, you know, please feel free to ask any questions throughout this session. Uh, you know, you can type your questions in either the chat or the Q&A Q &A, Q &A function and we will pick up the questions towards the end. So thank you very much again, Ian, and over to you. Good evening, it's great to meet you all today. We're pretty much still in lockdown here in the UK, but it's great that we can use Zoom and these features to speak to you all this evening. In speaking about banking, I'm very pleased with the support that the IFE has given to our banking initiative over the last year. I'll talk a little bit about it as I go on, but as you make it clear that in talking about banking today, I'm not representing the IFOA. I have no position on the council or any particular committee. I work in the banking members interest group. But I'm very pleased to, be able to share with you lessons I've learned from my 30 years in banking. And in doing it today, I'm extremely grateful to those of you who have submitted questions because it's difficult to know what's of value to students and the questions have been a very useful way to frame comments. So I'm going to go through some of the questions and talk about things from my experience and then on your behalf Karen will ask me further questions after the slides. Hmm. Slides not going on just hold it. So the first question you asked was, why did I work in finance instead of traditional actuarial area? I was brought up in Edinburgh and in my class at school, some of the friends had fathers who were doctors, it's quite big in Edinburgh, and I liked their professional standards. I respected these people as very good people, but I wasn't particularly interested in science. Other of the boys had fathers who were actuaries and I could see the parallel that these were professional people in financial services. But I was influenced by my own father who worked for a bank. He was actually a lawyer who worked for a bank. And when he came in and talked about things he was doing, I was interested in the way in which banks help the economy by enabling payments in your own country and abroad, by the simple intermediation of deposits and loans to help the economy to grow. So I found that all quite interesting. The other thing I liked about banking was that banking was global. Like many Scottish people, I had the aspiration to work abroad at some time and liked the fact that I worked for a bank I could work anywhere in the world. So those were the sorts of reasons that attracted me to banking when I was at school and university. The next question is amused at. The actuaries in banking do repetitive work, like rumors say, I don't know where these rumors came from. Let me tell you some things about my career in banking, anything but boring. The first stage of my banking career was in investment banking. 
I worked for a UK stockbroker, Philips & Drew, that was bought by the investment bank, UBS, a Swiss bank. In the first phase there, I developed international business, mainly with central banks, including in some of your countries. And I find working with central banks very interesting. Right. Then I did go abroad for two years. I worked for two years in Japan to get a securities branch license and found that a very challenging and worthwhile job. And looking back at my career and our family life, the two years in Japan and traveling to parts of your region are a very memorable part, a very rewarding part of my career. I might have liked to work abroad longer. It didn't turn out, but that was a great experience. And then when I came back, I was involved in integration of my firm, Phillips & Drew, with UBS. So lots of interesting things to do. And then having worked for UBS, I saw a lot of opportunities in banking. So I approached in my home country of Scotland, the Royal Bank of Scotland, and expressed an interest in working with that in strategy. And I did that for these 15 years. And as opposed to the question, which may have been a joke question, never a dull moment. Most of my life was in business as usual activities, but things like these were highlights. Establishing a supermarket banking joint venture with Tesco, the acquisition of NatWest, twice as large as RBS, more than twice as large. And in China, establishing a strategic partnership with Bank of China. I'd have been thrilled to do any one of these things, but doing many of these projects, I loved the fact that there was something new every day, every month, every year, and delivery of these kind of projects, meeting lots of interesting people. And then in the third stage, of my bank career. I've worked since I left RBS as an independent consultant, still in banking, but quite a different nature of work. I've been helping with new entrants with applications for banking licenses. In the UK, we have lots of new entrants, particularly fintech companies who are very smart on IT, but are less familiar with banking products and regulations. So it was great to be able to help them with their applications and with the capital adequacy assessment, which is a principal thing that a bank has to do, make sure it has enough capital to keep going. And I've also been involved in responding to regular consultations. That might be more like the question, a bit boring, but it's a very good way to keep up to date with developments in banking. Ah, the next question is about what it's like working for a bank, tasks, culture, salaries. Now, very little of my career has been working for insurance companies, so I can't make a true comparison, but I'll do my best. Just to remind you what you need to know about banking in one slide compared to insurance companies. The liabilities of banks are very simple. Insurance, life insurance, very complicated. In banking, it's mainly deposits, which are worth their value. And of course is equity capital or the capital to support the business. And the assets of a bank are mainly loans. Loans to personal customers, loans to corporate customers. It has other asset securities and it keeps liquid assets because if people withdraw the deposits, you need to have some money available to finance that. So banking, traditional banking, not investment banking, traditional banking is very simply about loans and deposits. Quite simple compared to some of the insurance and pension contracts. The main risks then are credit risk, operation risk and market risk, much the same as insurance, but credit risk is much more important. And banks hold the capital in the bottom left block for losses on the assets. And among the assets, they hold liquid assets to fund withdrawal. So that's the key point about banking. Moving on to compare that with insurance. As I said, the banking liabilities are simpler. So banking is more straightforward than insurance. The assets are mainly loans. 
So a key thing in banking is to understand credit risk. Credit risk is a main risk. And the credit risk dealing with different types of personal loans and different types of corporate loans is a major issue in banking, not just secured, unsecured, but loans for different purposes, loans of different types. Of course, banks like insurance called capital to ensure that they are viable and sustainable businesses. But in banking, liquidity is also very important. The banking crisis showed that if a bank had problems, people began to withdraw deposits and you could have run the bank. So in banking, you're always thinking of capital and liquidity. One of the advantages of banking, which enables it to be global, is that in most countries, banks follow the Basel regulations. They are a framework of regulation for banking, which are global. Not every country, but many countries sign up to them. And they prescribe minimum amounts of capital liquidity. Your local regulator may be more prudent and require higher amounts, but the basic regulation of banks is pretty similar worldwide. When I was in Japan, different country, different culture, but banking was quite similar. That's a task on the culture. My expense of insurance is limited, but I think there are differences in culture. First of all, for any of you, like me going into banking or my actual colleagues, people in banking are not going to understand exactly what exams you're passed and what value they are. They will probably be impressed by anything to do with being an actuary, but not know the details. So if you were approaching a bank, it's much more, what can you do for us? What are your skills? than what exams have you passed? It's your job, if you're going for a job interview, to understand a bit about banking and how your skills can be applied, which I'll discuss in the next few slides. A difference in banking is diversity against homogeneity. When I did train an insurance company, it was very easy to communicate to lots of other actuaries. In banking, you have a wide variety of people. So the disadvantage is communication may be more challenging. The advantage I found in banking and really appreciated looking back was it in problem solving, having diversity, all kinds of different people working in a problem, people with different ideas, different experience, different backgrounds is very useful. So it's not a world full of actuaries. There are actuaries. It's a world full of a diverse group of people. I found that very rewarding, although initially challenging. And then something that our president spoke about in his last address does apply to banking. There is a sense of speed versus accuracy, not being neglectful of details and careless about the numbers, but there's often an urgency to get an estimate of the numbers by today or by tomorrow very quickly. So to that extent, the culture is perhaps a bit more intense, but not really that different. And the question asked about remuneration, as you know, particularly investment bankers, but for many bankers in risk compliance areas in the world as a whole, they are pretty well paid. What essential skills are needed? The essential skills, very good question. So we're not talking here about exact technical models. I would pretty much reassure you from my experience that if you've done the technical work at school or in the actual exams, you're unlikely to find things in banking that will cause you any problem. There could be some very specialist aspects of investment banking products and hedging. We require to brush up technical things but not really new, more an expansion of your existing technical skills. So if you're going to banking, what you would need was a basic knowledge and understanding of products, risk and regulation. This is not high tech, it's just knowing what banking is all about. You need to have good engagement with colleagues. This is a diverse world. 
And bankers do work together in teams with different people representing different skills. And you have to work with them. In a bank, you'll be working mainly with people in risk and financial modeling. But banking is much more rewarding if you work with people who are engaged with customers or product development or other areas. And in, in solving problems in a first team, it is important to speak to the frontline people from whom you can learn a lot. So I think for many, many actuaries in banking, you might be interested and there will be an expectation that you are good at these last three things. The expectation is, I found, they would be good at solving problems. You could be, when RBS wanted to set up a joint venture with Tesco, I was asked to lead the project on the assumption that I would have the knowledge to do it or could figure it out. And the need for understanding and judgment, a degree of criticism is made of banks over the years about tick box compliance with the regulations. I always found as an actuary, the expectation was that I could understand the risks and risk management and could express views and make judgments and in a polite way, be constructive and raise challenges in a way that was helpful rather than just being difficult. Finally, working with people from these diverse backgrounds, clear and concise communications are required, both spoken and written. I mentioned the speed versus accuracy. So clear and concise, I find in a bank, you've got to get stuff down to the main points. And if you're asked a question, get the main points out first, and then your boss, your colleague can say, that sounds fine, tell us more. But you've got to get things boiled down to the key issues. What was most challenging? Next. It's almost difficult in the career to think, but it certainly wasn't technical. Um, I don't remember things that caused any technical problem. There was lack of experience, and that's why it was in, in my interest to go to people in the front line and ask. And provided you have that basic knowledge of products and risks and regulation, my experience in a bank was people only too pleased to talk about credit cards or personal loans or corporate loans or investment banking hedging. People enjoyed their work and were very pleased that somebody was interested to learn more about it and engage with them. There's a speed versus accuracy, the communication with people who don't speak the actual language. And then an issue in banking is that as actuaries, we operate under a code of regulation, a code of conduct. So although we have to comply with banking regulations, like doctors and teachers, we are professional people and we should observe the code of conduct. That makes us very appropriate for what in banking is called second line of defense roles. You're familiar with an actual function in an insurance company. There isn't such a thing in banking where the equivalent is the second line of defense, the review of risk, control of risks. So the fact that we are able to show understanding and judgment and challenge and operate under a code of conduct makes us suitable for these kind of roles. What I expect about work life balance. So, given I've mentioned the speed versus accuracy and a degree of pressure at times, this is a sensible question, but I don't think you could generally worry that banking is some highly intense workaholic way of life. You'll read just now, possibly as I do, about interns at Goldman Sachs and other investment banks being fed up about working 120 hours a week or something ridiculous, while being paid very, very large amounts of money, actually. But the investment banking work-life balance is familiar and never seems to change. But their situation is not true across the range, the spectrum shown here. So in the kinds of banks, the, the top of this list 
lifestyle is quite normal. People can have private lives. People have evenings off, do things, free weekends. Of course, there are some times in the year when special projects require a bit of intense work. But normally, life is what we would call normal. In my world of commercial banking and doing strategy, there were peaks of intense work before results or in projects, and then periods when life was quite quiet. So the work-life balance is um, an issue, but a different mix within these different types of banking. Where would it actually like to be working in the banking? The answer is clearly likely to be in risk management. I would make it clear not only in risk management, I never worked in risk management. And many of my actual colleagues never worked in risk management. So actuaries can find roles to apply their skills in other areas. But if lots of actuaries were into banking, risk management would be the most obvious area, risk management in a business unit, or what we would call group risk management, looking at risk across the bank as a whole. It's also very suitable for my area of strategy that in a banking operation, there's no point in having vague strategic aspirations without understanding the risk and the capital and liquidity. So actual skills are very suited for the problem solving characteristics of strategy. In treasury asset liability management, Actuaries are good at this, the asset liability matching. In banking, because of this liquidity risk, asset liability matching is a big risk, very super for actuaries. In retail banking, I recruited a colleague who is very successful in product pricing. He had done long-term product pricing in life insurance and transferred easily and happily into banking. Lots of things in investment banking, such as derivative hedging, and then remember, if you're in banking, you don't have to work for a bank. You could work for a new entry, like a fintech. You could work for a consultant in banking, or you could work for a central bank. So these are relatively obvious opportunities without being in a bank. Where would you probably be if you went to a bank? This is speaking to you as relatively young. So if you went into risk management, there'd be pros and cons between being in a business unit and in group risk. If you're in a business unit, you would work in one of the main risks and really understand risk. If you're working for a bank, it would be an advantage to have a really deep understanding of credit risk in particular. If you worked in the group risk, you would see all risks and actuaries are trained in enterprise wide risks. And it is very, very good to look across the whole bank. And it's very interesting to contribute to regulatory submissions because this is a sort of second line defense thing that an actuary might want to make their career in. Other obvious opportunities, just to put a few on one page, not to go on, data signs, there are huge opportunities in banking. Banking has tons of data. For those of you who are on this webinar, even from your current accounts or credit cards, banks can really understand what kind of customer behavior you have, what your needs might be and how they can meet the needs. So there's huge opportunities to apply machine learning to that data in customer benefits and for the bank's interest, in fraud detection and cybersecurity. Because of new entrants coming into banking, retail banking is becoming more competitive. And the skills in product pricing that I mentioned, where actually they're good, are more important. Banks have to think very carefully about pricing products more carefully than they have had to. And then I mentioned consulting as equally obvious to banking. I'm just mentioning two examples, there are many. Banks have to work out expected credit losses. This is very similar to provisions for insurance claim. 
many banks get consultants to help them with this large annual task. It is quite a difficult job in a bank and really does require understanding and judgment. So that's been a big opportunity for consultants to help banks. And the next one is going to be a huge opportunity. Whether COP26 does take place in Glasgow later this year or not, regulators globally are encouraging banks to think about stress testing for climate change. And this is stress testing over 20 or 30 years. Banks think in terms of one to five years, whereas actuaries who've been trained in an insurance world think of long-term stress testing. So I guess in banks and in consultants, there'll be a lot of opportunities for actuaries to help banks on climate change stress testing, a very interesting opportunity in itself. This is roughly what these two things are all about, that in expected credit losses, the accounting standard is IFRS 9, loans go in three stages, and you apply 12 months on lifetime time expected losses. Provisions go up a lot moving into recession. In climate change, you think of physical risks, the risks that would occur from floods or storms and transition risks, which is things like oil and gas and car companies changing from the current world to the new world. And banks are going to work out the impact on their customers with themselves over this long period of 30 years. Are any professional certification needed? Can you work in a bank without things? These sort of questions. So there is no, globally, there is no required professional qualification. Banks typically employ graduates from universities and they employ them from many disciplines, not just from maths and science, but from all over the place. Banks have a diverse range of needs and do benefit from diversity. So if you went in at the outset, the difference between people from different backgrounds may not be that great. There may be just a general graduate training program, and it is in your interest to get that foundation across the bank as a whole. So it's not essential, it is quite sensible. But it's not certain that that initial training will fit you for management roles and a career progression. Some employees choose to do qualifications like MBA, FRM, CFA, PRMA, but there are pros and cons there. It's good to do them, but looking back at my career, I wouldn't see any automatic or guaranteed link between doing these and accelerating your management career. It is good, but it's not necessarily transformational. So going to the next set of questions, they do focus on these professional papers. I talked about doctors and teachers, I recognized when I was young. Professional people are, have different qualities from ordinary senior employees. So let's think about professional papers. So bankers don't have to pass professional exams. It's strange given the amount of risk in banks and the damage that occurred to the global economy from the banking crisis 10 years ago. So it is surprising, but true. However, banks recognize professional qualifications and have many accountants, large numbers of accountants in business units and in the group central functions, mainly in finance, but not limited to finance. And of course, they have to employ a significant number of lawyers to ensure compliance with legal requirements and to look at terms and conditions and issues that arise. So bankers understand professionals. And in my experience, they understand that actuaries are professional risk managers. But as you will know, until now, there have only been a limited number of actuaries in banking. 
looking back, I would say that is not because bankers have any reluctance to employ actuaries, but not many actuaries have expressed an interest. The ones I know have done well and moved to quite senior roles, but their numbers are quite limited. And over the last year, the banking make the members interest group that I help has been supporting the IFA and the IFA has responded positively. You may have heard our president talking about it to encourage actuaries to think of banking as a legitimate area. Nobody's suggesting banking is better than traditional areas. And Swishi is very forceful always on respecting the importance of traditional roles and the work actuaries do in them. But we're moving to encourage actuaries to recognize banking as a potential area. One of the things we've done over the last year is go through the core subject. And look at areas such as those on the slides, where the knowledge you have gained is applicable in banking, but it doesn't say so in the course. Machine learning is particularly applicable. The loan pricing, people moved in with very little problem, and so on. So with a number of colleagues on the IFA, we have spoken to the leads for the subjects and have suggested additions to the course so that people studying these subjects would see that what they'd learned has applications in banking as well as insurance. And you may have seen these comments in the actuary, the January, February edition, that the working party looking at different banking courses wanted to have a professional course. We don't want just an exam in banking. We want people to be competent in the way, if you go to see a doctor or a teacher, you expect them to know all the facts, be able to tell you how to treat your illness or how to educate the relevant person. So as it had started in South Africa with an applications exam in bank in 2015, and we felt that this was better, more advanced, and more appropriate for actuaries who already done all the technical aspects in the core subjects. Many of the other bank qualifications would in fact overlap and repeat a lot of which in the core subject. So we felt we felt that this was an appropriate exam, but that it would be better if it was split like other subjects into principles and applications. So the IFA is engaged with ASA. We have produced a syllabus with both ASA and IFA have approved, which would be in these courses and subject to formal agreement, I should make it clear, not speaking on behalf of the IFA, that this has not been finally and formally agreed, but the expectation is it will be agreed, and the hope is that these exams will be available next year. For actually going to banking, as I said, bankers don't have to sit exams, and you don't have to sit banking exams. I and many of my actual colleagues in banking went into banking on the existing actuarial qualifications with no specific training in banking. So it's clearly desirable, but not necessary. So we're thinking of actuaries who for whatever reason don't want to do banking exams, possibly because they're age 30 or 40 and don't want to go back to training or whatever the reason is. And we hope to help IFA members with education, with telling them what they need to do about banking, to help them get a job in banking, current topics, not just doing your job, but learning about things that are of interest to bankers, responding to consultations, research, events and networking. And the IFA suggested that we, we launch 
a banking online community, which we are piloting over the next month, and we'll be holding events. For example, on Friday, I'll be talking under education about the, what you need to know about the Badger regulations, not everything you could learn or you need to know. And then next Friday, we'll have an open discussion about this climate change stress testing and our actuary is going to go off from that. So we do recognize the need to help people with non-examined banking information. And what kind of material would I recommend for you to be up to date with the industry and why do we thinking? Note this question is very good, up to date and wider. So to be up to date, I would recommend that you do look at consultation by regulators. For your central bank or any central bank, I'm sure it's all online and quite easy to track these things down. And if you look at a list of recent consultations, many of them are pretty boring and not really interesting to you. But things like climate change, expected losses, you would realize are of considerable interest, fair pricing of products. And I, I found reading consultations is the best way to be up to date. And as a consultant, I have to be, as you were being in your job interview, I work for one client and another client. So I do find up to date in consultations is a smart thing to do. I think one of the problems of actuaries is we tend to live in a fairly narrow world. And so the other things here are all about, what well, the question was widen your way of thinking, be broader to help to engage with this diverse group of people. For 30, 40 years, I've read The Economist each week. Now in your region, there may be equivalent or better things, but some of that which covers lots of economic related, business and economics matters, I find pretty sensible. I don't read it, I flick through it, but it just picks up interesting things that I might have missed in the news. In IT, you should understand about FinTech and how machine learning can transform banking. Not just being an actuary, we're not trying to be accountants, but you should understand accounting standards such as IFRS 9, which are important to banking. For climate change, you want to understand the disclosures that banks have to make and how they're going to do stress testing. In economics, an example of something we're talking about in this community is the potential impact of negative interest rates. Not in every country, but in some countries, governments have moved to negative policy rates. In the UK, the Bank of England is considering it. And then in strategy, concepts that you may or may not have covered in the course about competitive advantage, SWAT, strengths, weakness, opportunity, threats. So my message to you in response to this question is, consultations keep you updated in banking, but a more important thinking if you're going to, a more important issue, if you're thinking of into banking, is to broaden your knowledge so that you could engage easily with people who are working in all different areas of the bank. And then a final question in this list, what advice would you give somebody who wants to excel in this career? I think the answer here is, if you're on Excel, it doesn't really matter whether it's banking or not. I think it's very important that you want to continue to learn. I guess it's true of many actuaries that you always do want to keep up to date and broaden your experience. And I find working in banking, you are learning all the time because There'll be a project in credit cards and then in corporate banking. And with going around the different parts of the bank, you learn gradually about the whole lot. And I think CPD is important. I've taken my IFA CPD pretty seriously and I welcome the change we're making. I think the bureaucracy was rather tiresome. And if you're in banking, you don't go to in-house meetings in the same way. But I think a reflective discussion with an experienced colleague is a good thing. And members of the banking, members of this group would be happy to help people who are looking for a colleague to speak to. In progressing your career, I would encourage actors to volunteer for special projects. You may join a bank and be rather lost in the crowd, but if they were looking for volunteers for a project about climate change stress testing, 
and you were on it, working with a group of other people, you would be more visible at the forefront and have an opportunity to be identified as a competent person who could be allocated to other special projects or appropriate work. And the main area, I think that actually should play to the strengths. So those, some of you will have quite different personalities and interests from me, but in general, I don't think actuaries are best suited to general management jobs, which involve looking at lots of people and lots of bureaucracy and lots of processes. And the actuaries generally are like to be happier in niche areas, which require the application of brain power to solving problem, understanding the issue and applying judgment. So thank you very much for your attention. Happy to answer any questions. Karen, you're going to ask me some questions, I think. Yes, thank, thank you very much, um, Ian, for this uh, very interesting presentation. And I hope that the students have gained some insights uh, from the discussions today. We do have some questions and I uh, would like to encourage more questions from the students. So uh, we do have one question in the chat box here, which is from Weiwei. And Wei is asking whether is it difficult to change, um, you know, their career paths once they have started in banking or once they have started in insurance industry to move between the different industries. Is it difficult to do so, Ian? And are there any challenges or, or you know, obstructions if they wish to do so? My, my experience is that it is not difficult to change if you want to do so. The members of the banking group in the UK generally moved when they were in mid-career because you were interested in some issue. But if you're moving in mid-career, you, you have to make the effort. So you couldn't approach a bank saying, I'm an actuary, have you got a job? I went to a bank saying, I'm really interested in strategy, I'd like to work for you. And they said, no, there's no vacancy. And they came back two years, our person's left, can you start on Monday morning? So you've got to make the effort. And that's why I think the last question is very important. Because if, if, if a mid-career person were going to a bank now, actually talking about credit risk and market risk would bore them to death. The, the banks are worried about today's problem. Today's problem is managing through COVID-19, beginning to manage climate change, expected credit losses, possible negative interest rates. So if you're going to engage with a bank, you have to have this broader knowledge because if you're in mid-career, your technical skills are likely to be taken for granted. The question is whether you will fit in to this broader group of people. There are pros and cons in joining as a student or joining later. If, if members were interested in doing the banking exams we're talking about, they'd be very easy when you're working for a bank and much less easy if you're not in the language and culture of a bank. It's really the language, the terminology. If you're working in a bank, it becomes so familiar that the exams are quite easy. But obviously, if you were to join as a student, it's a less well-established career path. And if you wanted study leave or things like that, you'd have to negotiate. It wouldn't be provided as standard. Although, as I say, people who do MBAs or the qualifications are well treated. It's just that the actual exams aren't well recognized. So students could join from university as a number of people from cash business, you know, a professor at cash business school. Some people go straight to banking from doing the degree, or you go when you're age 30 or 40. I don't think one is better than the other. It depends on the person, there are pros and cons. You could do either route. It would never be too late because provided you present yourselves correctly, your experience will be of value. That's, that's very helpful to know, Ian, that there is no pros and cons with either approach. No. 
It's up to, up to people to decide. There are definite advantages in both and disadvantages in both. Um, and either could be rewarding. Very good, interesting. Um, and the other question that we've received, it's um, does banking has, you know, does the banking world have any potential to evolve in the future? And then if it does, what type of significant changes uh, from your point of view do you see, um, you know, say in 10, 20 years time in the banking world? So one of the reasons when I went into banking was really to do with this question. Because obviously I live in Europe, although I've traveled a lot when I was in Europe, but I know Europe much better. And in Europe, banking really was established from trade, particularly in the Renaissance in Italy 500 years ago. And banking developed across Europe over the last 300 years or so. Banking is always changing, but I am very confident because of the interface between banking and the economy that there will be a role for banking. You need banking for your economic well-being. That is, you don't want to have cash in pound notes under your bed. You want to have in the bank. Getting loans helps personal and corporate progress. So banking is a vital service. It will evolve. And this is, for me, really good and exciting in your career. And why I slightly tease the question you asked, is banking ever boring? Banking is quite different now from 10 years ago. The banking crisis brought a lot of lessons to life about shortcomings in banking, which have been largely addressed in Basel III. Banking will change a lot in the next 10 years. The development of fintech and machine learning will transform retail banking. So I guess in 10 years, you will be able to look online at well-development platforms to get education on products, information on products, advice on products, and do your banking online, and indeed have a platform which covers banking, insurance, savings, all your bills and financial affairs. It's really exciting now. And this is one reason we've been banking now. The Lorita banking was relatively boring in the past. It is being transformed by technology and moving from branches to online platforms. Similar <coughs> is happening in investment banking. You and your colleagues will know that the sort of sales and trading thing I was involved in 30 years ago doesn't really exist now with so much more automated trading and algorithmic trading all online. So technology is transforming banking and it underlines the threat like machine learning to many boarding jobs, but the need for people like actuaries to manage these things. So in, for example, in the changing technology in retail banking, actuaries bring the understanding and judgment but they also bring the code of ethics because you want this to be good for customers rather than some of the things you hear about some social media platforms using data for bad purposes. So banking will continue to change. And I think that makes it an exciting prospect. Yeah. And then we hear about, you know, these days in um, digital banking, or even, um, you know, companies like, for example, the equivalent of um, Uber in Southeast Asia, Grab, is also moving to, um, you know, e-banking, e-wallet, that kind of um, uh, future. So it's definitely very exciting. But I believe what you are saying is that the skill sets that you uh, may have now is portable, regardless if it's like a physical banking or even a digital banking, some of the skills would still apply. Is that right? The skills, skills would apply and be appreciated. And in that, the now or later is quite different. Because when I was talking about the question on going in now or later, I was imagining this point to a big bureaucratic banking organization. But the fintechs are very approachable. I have worked for one in particular in the UK on their bank application and immediately and actually your skills were appreciated 
and you were asked about lots of day-to-day -day problems that arose. So jobs in, in fintechs, I would give a different answer from the general question about going to a large universal bank. I think the jobs in fintech are fantastically interesting. The difficulty there is you don't know who the winners and losers will be. But in tomorrow's world, if you gain knowledge in fintech, and it's not just machine learning as modeling, I think if you're in this area, there'll be people who are very, very specialist in machine learning, but don't necessarily know much about customers or products or regulations. And there'll be people who know about customers. And I see actuaries as covering the whole ground of being able to work with the modelers and work with the um, people who do the customer facing information online and living up to the code of ethics for which the, some of your colleagues may know the IOV in the UK did a paper, a guide to ethical data science, which is very important. So I, I think for those who are interested in modern banking, working in a fintech could be very, very exciting. Excellent, excellent. And, and you know, Ian, what, what do you reckon about the future development of, of banking? Uh, this is a question from Sherry, um, and she's asked specifically to the Asia Pacific region, um, the development, in, in, you know, for banking in this region. And also the second question is, you know, it's uh, climate risk management, for example, green financing, stress testing, going to be an emerging sector uh, for banking in, Malay in Asia. So in, as I mentioned on one of the early slides, <clears throat> there are a lot of truly global banks. So in your countries, as in Europe, you recognize the names of global banks. The problem for other banks in the technology world, as we know from Facebook and Google, economies of scale become more and more important. In a branch banking world, the physical locality was a principal reason for choosing a bank because you could pop down to the branch during your lunch break. So in global banking, you have to have scale. The very, very large banks are probably limited by competition rules and can't become much larger or they become monopolies, oligopolies. In other countries, there may be consolidation of banking to produce what is called national champions to compete with these global banks. I think economies of scale, I think, will polarize banking into super banks and small banks. It may be a cliche, but I think it's going to be true in this technology banking. Being a middle sized bank is not so good. You want to be very large and the economy scales are very small and focus on particular products or types of customers. In the change that is happening, you're identifying some points. I was actually writing about last night in this draft, one of the chapters I'm doing for the courses we hope to launch. So traditionally, I mentioned, retail banking could have been seen to be quite dull. But in future, it would be logical to differentiate green mortgages from ordinary mortgages. Because if I get my house double glazed and all um, zero carbon, the value of that house in the future will be greater than my neighbor's house who doesn't have it. So it's economically sensible for banks to be giving lower mortgage rates on mortgages, similarly on car loans. If you buy a diesel car, it won't be worth anything in five years, but a new electric car will. So there will be an opportunity for differentiating pricing, and that could reflect the bank's own interests, or it could reflect the interests of the government and the economy as a whole to encourage green finance and to support banks doing it. So in the current COVID crisis, 
government and banks have worked pretty well in many countries to help individuals and companies through it. And I can see lots of opportunities here. I'm not worried about talking about polit politics of different approaches, but I think the, the government and banks will work together given the urgency of addressing climate change to try and encourage green finance for individuals. Obviously for corporates, they like to have green bonds issued to finance infrastructure projects, but it is a very big area. Now for actuaries, this is unknown. So your students here will be worried about barriers to entry and what do they know at banking? What do actuaries, what do bankers know about green finance and these things, not very much. So one attraction is that there are no particular bars of entry because people who work for banks for 30 years don't know any more than us about these things. All they know is that life is going to change. So technology and climate change are two important things. Now, in climate change, you may or may not know about it, but a lot of good work has been done by groups of central banks and governments. And I do think we'll see a lot of action on this over the next few years. And you know, the in vehicles in various countries, government said in quite short deadlines for new cars must be low carbon electric or whatever they are. So these are areas. So they're very interesting, exciting. They fit actuaries who want to be in the problem solving area rather than just managing people area. And most important for me, the barriers to entry are very low because nobody knows better. But I think you'd want to be working in this diverse team. You wouldn't want a team of only actuaries. Actuaries could bring a quality along with others on working in these very interesting projects. That leads us quite nicely to the next question, Ian, is that whether in the future with all these different automation, uh, you know, whether the tasks done by um, actuaries or even the current bankers now, would, would, would those tasks be replaced or you reckon there'll be any new ones coming up, uh, you know, in, in the banking world? Oh, I mentioned this. I don't want to be critical of banks. I've loved my career in banking, but the regulators have been critical of banks for what they called tick box compliance rather than understanding and judgment. And there's a danger that when you have the Basel regulations and national regulations on top, there are so many regulations, life is easy if you just comply with the regulations. But these are the jobs that may be made redundant by automation. If the job is merely the application of the prescribed regulations, then you can train a machine to do that as well as we can. And that's why I encourage actuaries in the slides to focus on problem solving, understanding and judgment, that if you're at that level above, then the machines need to be managed. The programs need to be supervised. The ethics need to be thought about. So if you are, many traditional roles will be under pressure or allied to under pressure. But the kind of jobs that actually should be doing, which are not regular daily boring jobs, but are responding to issues and challenges that arise, of course, these will still exist and, and possibly be more interesting because you, you don't have to do the boring part of the job. Okay. So, so you know, we, we talk a lot about uh, banking, right, Ian? And if we could uh, perhaps pick your brains as well, um, you know, on, on actuaries working, say, in um, those wealth management, asset management type of um, companies, because these days we do see a lot of uh, new pop-ups of online app platform, you know, where you, you, you invest mm -hmm. some money, um, you know, some examples uh, quoted here, uh, Stash Away, eToro. So these are platforms that I would say probably more Asia-related or Asia-based, but mm -hmm. Is there a need for actuaries there or uh, what, 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 are, what are your views? Well, as I say, I worked for a FinTech as a consultant and was quickly asked to help on this problem, that problem, the next problem. 
So I don't think there'll be lots of roles for lots of actuaries, but you understand the role I had at RBS was head of strategy, including strategic risk, as opposed to managing the risk day to day in all the bureaucracy that that meant. So I think an actuary who is doing kind of strategy and risk zone for the business would bring a lot of very interesting qualities. The other point comes back to this question of, is it better to go into a large bank now or later? And for any graduate applying for a job, there's this frustrating, you're very good, but you've had no experience kind of drive around the bend. Of course, you're no experience, you're a new graduate. But for a new graduate joining a large university bank is quite challenging and quite difficult to figure it out. An alternative, which is more straightforward, is to work for a fintech or a private bank or a wealth management or a specialist area and move on from there. Once you have banking skills, it's easy to work in another bank. I think if you're working for a central bank, that you really got to meet your best shot from university. I think you want to be a good graduate and go to work in a central bank. But if you went to a fintech or startup as a young actuary, you would learn so much so quickly. And I think you'd be appreciated because these companies don't have the large bureaucracies that inevitably large, not just banks, any large company will have quite a complicated bureaucracy for somebody to navigate from university. Whereas these startups are much easier to, to get your mind around. So I wouldn't, again, I wouldn't say, I'd be very careful to avoid saying that a small organization is better than large or vice versa. But in terms of getting going your career, it's much easier to get going in a small organization than in a very large organization. Thank you very much, Ian. Uh, you know, the time now is past uh, 7 p.m. Uh, local uh, and uh, noon for, for Ian. And um, we would bring this uh, presentation and webinar to a close. So uh, before we end, Ian, just a quick question. Would you be happy uh, to share your slides with all the uh, attendees today? Yes, of course, yes. Yep, all right. That's yep. brilliant. So uh, we will uh, share a copy of the presentation slides with all the attendees as well as the recording. Um, and finally, if you have any further questions, uh, please feel free to drop us an email um, and uh, we would appreciate if you could share some of your feedback on today's session today. Um, so thank you very much, Ian, uh, for a wonderful session. And uh, thank you very much to all the students for the questions asked. Um, you know, we hope that you, know, you have gained some very useful insights from today's talk and hopefully inspire you to consider a career in banking. So thank you very much for all your time today and have a very pleasant evening.